So good morning, everyone. All right. Thank you for being with us today. So I welcome all of you this morning to the forums titled Resilient Designing, Energy Conservation and Climate Responsive Architecture. It's hosted by Nairo Ceramic Groups in collaboration with Hijaz Kasturi Associates and Yambar Hats and Malaysian Architecture Student Alliance. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm architect interior designer, Ikemi, and it's my pleasure to be invited to facilitate today's session. So our, as we are getting back to the physical scene as, as present, so it's great to have all of you with us today on this credit drive. I would love to welcome our VIP, Dr. Ian Kong, the Managing Director of Ceramic, a uh, Naira Ceramic Group. Dr. Architect Serena Hijaz, Principal Director of Hijaz Kasturi Sharia Berhan, and Deputy President of Malaysia Green Building Council. Managing Directors of Asia Design Architects and Reverend Directors of Asia Design Architects and Reverend Corporate Members at Pertuma Architect Malaysia and Registered Architect for the Public Architect Malaysia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Architects and designers have controls over our built environment by changing the ways we design cities and buildings to connect to nature, bringing our proximity closer to nature and shifting our physical relationships to the environment. So with that being said, today we will be participating in in-depth discussions on reconnecting people with nature through architectures and design. So in today's fast moving world, we believe this will be beneficial to all of you who are the young architects and designers, designers in the making. So before we begin, here are some house rules to ensure a smooth flow of presentations and events. Can you switch your, your phones on silent modes to avoid any inconvenience during the events? Please raise your hands during the Q&A sections, state your names and corporations that you are representing before your questions and your questions will be answered accordingly. The restrooms are on the right and left, so um, you may get our team to assist you if you need any assistance. Primaticalism is a sustainable passive design method that is entirely driven by the climatic elements like sun anger, winds, directions and environmental components. So these architectures aims to design highly effectively buildings, creating a sustainable built environment. Meanwhile, achieving a high level of thermal comfort, human well-being and space. So highlighting new ideas of biophilic architectures. Without further ado, let's begin our sections today. It's with a great delight that I invite architect Poi Jong Wai, managing directors of managing directors of Asia Design Architects and Berhad, directors of Asia Design Works and Berhad, corporate members at Pertuma Architect Malaysia and registered architect with Lembaga Architect Malaysia, onto the stage to share his expertise on the topic title Climatic Architectures. Uh, thank you, Architect Kami. Uh, thanks, Nairo, to invite me as part of the speaker. Uh, morning, uh, Dr. Dr. Sanina. Uh, today is a Saturday morning. Can we a bit relax? Yeah? Don't be too serious. You know? Try to enjoy. You know? We are here to serve, to save the planet. Yeah. Right, today I will share with you with climaticalism. Before that, let me throw you three questions. Can we move towards a sustainable way of living? It's a very serious question to our own self. We want to consume lesser. Can you sacrifice yourself? Can you stop shopping? Shopping, the more red pepper, why don't you just go to Pasamala and buy yourself 
with your own Tupperware. Can you? No, this is a question we have to ask. If can't, then how can we save the planet? We can't. Um, second is, what is the problem? Are, are, is there any problem in sustainable design? Do you feel any global warming? Is there any matter to our own life? Or this is just a whole hard thing, you know, because the lecturers are telling that, because the Senna are telling that. That's why we have to uh, do something on uh, sustainable. Why sustainable agenda is a must? Is it true? Or is it just a marketing tools, marketing strategies? Ask to buy something else, more green, hybrid card. The third question is very important. Is green an affordable movement? Or green is just something make things more expensive? Why the electricity car is more expensive than a petrol car? Is there something wrong? Is that only the rich people can go for green, but our normal people have to use a petrol car or even diesel car? So we, without making the green affordable, this movement cannot be successful. This is real. Yeah. So these are three questions we uh, I three out for the thought. The real problem is, now we talk about the real problem. Our system is an open, wasteful use of non renewable resources and pollutions. Any material we use will be gone. It's non renewable and pollutions. The second truth is resources available to support human life has been reduced by population growth. The planet is still the same size, but we need to share more to more people every year, years by years, because the population keeps growing. Today, actually, we are not enough chickens to sustain our uh, KFC. So this is the uh, truth that we're facing today. This is Ipoh. Uh, it's my hometown. Every time I drive back to Ipoh, uh, this is a scene that welcomed me back home. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, mining, our, uh, uh, our, uh, the, stone, the stone mountain. Dana Sopa Yang Theatre Gandhi. I think the, the, the government, the Jabatan Pertanian purposely put it there. I agree with that, Satuju. Yeah. But it's still going on, this kind of uh, mining. And uh, who fault is that? It's not something fault. They, we want cement to build home. This is where the cement from. We want the marble yeah, to, to decorate our living room, and this is where the marble from. And once we use that materials, uh, my hometown, all the miles will gone. So this is another uh, fact. We are in the shrinking earth. The data show you the ecological footprint. The calculation is we take the overall land size divided by the populations. In 1900, every one of us enjoyed 7.9 hectares of land. Because our roof, our, our handphone, our, our, our house is all the resources all taken from the land. But in 2030, the population grew and our earth is still the same size. We only enjoy 1.7 hectare per capita. Like you, like in the, we put into today, today lifestyle, American. Their lifestyle, they need 9.5 hectares to support their lifestyle. The burger, the sun, bigger, the driver, the truck is bigger. If compared to China and India, India is only 1.3 hectares to support their lifestyle. Uh, I do my own calculations. Um, it's about 2.5 uh, for average Malaysians. Yeah, maybe Dr. Sardinia is higher. Because this is all the lifestyle that we need. The, planet or the earth to support us. Can you imagine what is your all the youngest here after 20 years, 30 years, what's the figures? That's why now our house is become smaller and smaller because our land is lesser and lesser. We have to compete with each other. This is a real photo on the left hand side. It's taken from one of the uh, house estates in America. The Right hand side 
is taken from a China village. So can you see how big the house, the cars, and how the China village life is just a small quarters, then people can stay inside. And this is how the uh, ecological footprint uh, compar comparison, comparison in these two countries. Now, don't forget, China is growing. China ecological footprint growing at 4% per year. It's equivalent 100 million hectares per year. Previous, last time, 20 years ago, Beijing, they're all bike. But now, if you go to Beijing, it's all sport car, all the infra, very high tech infra. And this trend is keep growing. And we can, we can foresee it in the future, the resources will become scarier and all of us will fight for resources. And this is what happened in Malaysia. Now the chickens cannot export to anywhere else, only can consume in Malaysia. We are not enough chicken now. And our house, you know, previously our grandparents stayed in Kampong house, can be 1,000 or 2,000 square feet. And now our, our youngest, they can stay in 450 studio. This is the this is a real impact to our lifestyle, ecological footprint. And don't forget, our population keep increasing. In twenty in twenty, oh, today is seven point eight billion. In twenty thirty, we talk about eight point two billion. Yeah. So is a good reason uh, we are here because it's a real problem to our lifestyle and futures, especially for young people. So let's go, go to the topic. What's a passive design? Uh, passive design. The key word is a passive. Let's look at what's a passive first. The passive, in dictionary, we go to an old school, yeah? not acting to influence or change the situations. We do not do anything. Other people or things will take care of it to be in control. It's called passive. This is what we like, meditation. Any problem, just meditate. Don't do anything, sit there, everything will be fine. Yeah, that's is meditation. It's a passive, okay? Another thing we like is a passive income. Passive income means the money that you earn without having to work for every day. For example, like uh, you receive a renting, um, renting income out of your properties. This is the income we want, right? This is passive income. Like this, uh, you just you can go holiday, you know, do nothing, and the money keep coming up. But it's only happened in my dream. Anyway, we start with passive design first before we go for passive income. Now, passive design, likewise, passive design is a system or structure that directly uses natural energy such as sunlight, wind, temperature differences, or gravity to achieve a result without electricity or fuel. So we don't use any energies to, to design the building and to make the building convert. This is passive design. I just want some uh, real facts in our GBI assessment systems. In GBI, I done a research. If we design a building without any equipment, without any energy use, yeah, maybe fan, yes. How much we score in GBI? I need to, uh, no, uh, it's in only thirty eight percent. This is GBI. How if you use all the great technologies, most effective aircon? and we can got 40%. It means that GBI is not so encouraged in the passive design. You know, I, I urge a GBI <laughs> increase a bit on the passive design score to, to give a more encouragement, you know. And the, yeah, this is just a side uh, request from my side. So let's talk about passive design in principle. Design without defense of mechanical devices um, like Acorn, solar panels, we turbines. We are talking about totally passive. Uh, this is a, a, 
extreme case, we look at the passive design itself. So it's quite hard to achieve in the real buildings. Second, the design attempts to control the comfort, heating and cooling without consuming fuels. In a building, the 60% of the energy actually go to the aircon heating system, heaters. This is 60% of the energies. So we need to control the comfort without using these um, equipment or fuels. The third is integrated essential building elements. No single part can take away all functionals. This is from my point of view. When we design the windows, sustainable or not sustainable, passive or not passive, you still need a windows. So window is an essential element. So we, we, we um, can we not just add another layer of uh, like sunscreen just to protect the sun, but we have a, uh, we, we have a bad design on the windows in the first place. So this is what, what I uh, try to uh, share with you. Can we integrate essential building elements? No single extra part to take away. So what the passive design uh, does, 100% uh, passive design, we do not install renewable energy device. It's because uh, all these devices is a mechanical uh, equipment. You need maintenance. You need to replace it after 20 years. I just visited a building in uh, Putrajaya, uh, Cyber uh, Putrajaya, one of the uh, high tech buildings in 20 years ago. And today, the facilities managers are very hectic because uh, they told me a lot of systems they need to change today. And they need to spend a few years doing it just to change all the uh, high tech uh, devices that they used to design in, in 20 years ago. Uh, so we try not to do that. Do not break up the entire site yeah, because in passive design, the site, we are very site sensitive. We want to use the site as our, our part of our design strategies. Do not rely on the aircon systems. Um, yes, this is, a, it's a, this is one of the things that we need to achieve. Do not install building a smart system. Well, some people may be against that, but all these systems also need to be replaced after 10 years or 20 years. So all of these replaceable elements are not considered in the passive design. Uh, this is our um, design principle. And I wish I will share my students uh, to make it easier to remember what's a passive design elements like. It's a five elements. Uh, we can use SWOT. A lot of students now they learn SWOT in architecture, but they're for, from business, they're not from architecture. Uh, never mind, we use SWOT. I uh, use SWOT as well, SWWOT, uh, sun, wind, water, orientations, and trees. Trees is in greenery. So, with these five elements, actually, you can design a very good passive design buildings. So you can do that just with these five elements. I'll show you an example. All the passive design is talking about climatic design. I show you the evidence. Let's go back to more on academic here. Um, Villa Sophia, designed by Lee Corbusier in, 20, in 1929. A location in outskirts Paris called Poissy. The climate is very dry and cold. I think everyone is very familiar with this design. Very famous architectures. Look at the uh, Poissy temperatures. In over the year, they only have few hours um, in July and August. In the summer time, it's considered warm and comfortable. Uh, almost 80% of the time is in the cold radius. And this is how it was like. And the sun, average sun is about 12 hours. Uh, winters are 8 hours. This is how the course is like. Now we go to another project designed by same architects in 1950 in uh, Chandika Capital Complex. Capital uh, in Chandika, most of the time is in the hot or sweltering uh, weather. And the sun is uh, on uh, the lot of sun, sun hours, a lot of sun hours, average is about 12 hours. Even during the winter, talking about 10 hours. And we compare the two climates and we, we 
can come up with conclusions. Uh, these are very extreme uh, differences. And Chantika is a very hot city, and the policy is a relatively cold city. And you put it side by side. How do you uh, deal with the two different designs in two different locations and different climates? The sun, Vila Sabia, do not have any sun shading device or hood. I suppose the roof garden and some half, so a nice roof garden. Whereas you will see the Chandika, they not welcome sunlight or heat. The enormous sun shading device, thin walls, and projectors, hoods, that even have a very big cutters to cut down the direct sunlight. Let's look at the wheat. Villa Savia, they use casement ribbon windows and close design when they're doing the windows because in the cold country, they don't want the green no float, uh, breeze in the indoor. So not welcome directly to the cold, wind, cold weather. And Chandika, in the other way around, welcome wind. They use wind wall to direct the wind, open facade concept. Water, Villa Savia do not have any water features, but in Chantika, the water feature surrounded the building, evaporation effect to create a microclimate, cool down the wind before penetrate into the buildings. So it used water to cool down the temperatures. Orientation both of them, uh, both more or less the same, greenery, only Villa Savia have a greenery. So here imagine why the same architects have a two different styles in design. Especially in the old days, uh, before the acorn invented, they very much depends on the passive design. And this is how our, our great architects uh, create the buildings, respond to the buildings in a very, uh, in a very distinguished way. Now let's look at uh, our uh, modern uh, buildings. This is a Samaric X, we call cooking towers, look like a cooking designed by Norman Foster. Very nice buildings. And do you know how Norman Foster designed this building? Uh, in London, they have a law, if you build any high-rise building, you cannot block the sunlight, or you need to maintain a minimum sunlight for the street. So this is the site, and these are some angles. This is a height that you can build on this site. And Norman Foster is a very uh, smart architect. He's a, he's a great architect. So he wants to maximize the GFA and make the tower taller. So how? Why don't he use up the empty space and use the sun angles to generate the form? This is how he start with the design. A nice form design using sun angles as a generator. See, so he are not come with a uh, own design. One is a cooking like tower, bullet like towers. No, it's a site. It's all about sun angles in London. And if you review his um buildings, he always use a uh, sun angles or sunlight. It's all his building. This is a Berlin Parliament. It's a very nice dome, transparent and mirrors, so it can. Reflect the light all the way down the parliament hall. This is his strategist. And this is a London council, city council. And you can see the facade, the, dif the different direction, uh, dif the different, on the, uh, different directions. The facade design is different. And they design the facade differently. Like on the left hand side, they need more sunlight from the side. I think it's towards the west. Yeah, so they have a more uh, transparent, whereas on the right hand side, there are more offices space, so they don't need a huge sunlight going into the building. This is how the design the facade differently. This is how it looks like in the uh, city council hall. All natural, natural light. So, Norman Foster, all about sun. I think it's a very Got evidence to show he used the sun as a design generator. Come back to our uh, our countries. This is in the tropical climate Singapore, designed by Dr. Ken Yang. It's a national library. And Dr. Ken Yang very good on the 
wheat. Yeah, he, 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 he really understands how wheat works. Uh, even he, he did not write it a lot in his book on the wheat design, but I worked with him before. Uh, so I know he's, he's very good in the wheat predictions. This, he always used a technique to create a wind flow, uh, like have a huge atrium, because atrium with this height can create a stacking effect. So you can create an internal ventilation. And if you look at the entrance, the entrance have a small gap, big gap, and thin wall. Actually, you try to create a different pressure, and you can create a wind tunnel. And it's true, I visited uh, this building, uh, and this Amno Tower, uh, one of the earliest uh, projects he did, has a, a significant, significant design is the wind uh, fin wall. The fin wall actually is to direct, to direct the wind get into the uh, command area. This is what he tried to do, and it should is work. Yeah. Because a big gap, small gap, to create a venture effect. This is the science. This is a TTDF Plaza, also one of the earliest uh, projects in 1996. And if you stand over the center of the plaza, you can feel the green keep busy. And please keep in mind, in 1990, simulation tool is not the common. It's not like today, we have a lot of simulation tools for Revit, for Rhino. During the time, we only can use the experience, our knowledge of science, you know, and do some experiment in the physical models to get it right. So this is all about uh, weight or Dr. Kenya. All about weight, using the weight as a design generator. And lastly, I show uh, my own buildings. I cannot show all other buildings. Impression by people, what do you do? Talk me. Okay, I show you my own building. Uh, this building is a 100% passive design. Uh, it's, a, it's a toilet for a school in Ipo. So I try to push a very uh, extreme on the passive design. These are sections, there are two sections. Uh, it's a toilet. This is how it looks. Uh, we use a pocket cartons. We I I study the, the the site contest. The first principle is we do not cut any trees, even though it's a very small site. But we try to uh, make it very effectively cut down whatever not necessary, and then we design just nice uh, in area. And also, when we design a building, we need to foresee you know, how it's looked like one year later, five years later. So we already pre, pre um, get all the space ready for the plants to grow, plant the box, the soils, and where is the outlet in the water taps, as a truck. And this is a single pitch roof because it's easier to collect waters, the water won't flow everywhere, and there's, there's a no, no full walls. And actually, locations is located just in front of the main gate because they do not have others uh, land for us to build. And if you look at it, it's not look like a conventional toilet, like what we see in our up you know, in, along the highway. No, um, this they also built another identical toilet behind the classroom. I still use, I mean, it's, it's the same principles. We check the sun angles because in the classroom, behind the classroom, they have a corridor. And we do, want, we do not want to block the sunlight along the corridors. Beside the toilets, you can see there's another building uh, designed and built by our bank contractors. Single story storerooms. You can see the quality of light. This is how the buildings work. You know, if you're not sensitive to the Sustainable design is the this is the environment we create for the students. It's very dark, dark uh, corridors. Whereas the same single story buildings, yeah, we still keep the sunlight. We do not disturb sunlight to the classroom. We do not door. We use the you no. Know, we try to adjust our setting according to the site. So we use a tree as our uh, entrance statement. 
and we don't have a meat, we do not have a dough. Uh, so actually, my perspective is to, is to create more ventilations. We don't want any enclosed the buildings. Uh, for, but for the school, right, we solve the social issues because no one can hide inside the toilets during the class. So we solve a bit of bonding issues and also smoking issues because if you smoke in this toilet, anyone can see it. Yeah. And there's an internal, internal light. Uh, during daytime, we do not need to on the light. It's very bright inside and very ventilated. You do, need, you do not need a blower or extract, extract fan. You do, do need all these equipments. And we designed a, a basic. It's a gravity flow. Uh, behind the wall is a union. You know, so we do not use palm or very complicated uh, pipes. And also we can you know, teach the student, uh, educate the students, say you know, all the water have to, uh, have to use twice with the clean waters and encourage the students to wash their hands after business, especially guys. So it gives a great some story for them. And the house, this house actually we recycled from the classroom, 70 years old house from France. So we select all the good house, and then we study how the roof like, how, how the joint like, and then we use a steel uh, patterns to recycle it back. And we hope it can last another 70 years. And, and the internal design, all the piping exposed because it's easier for maintenance. If anything goes wrong, they just they can see it, they can replace it without any hacking or complicated job. And we also uh, you know, we, we, we request all the materials must get it from Ipo, not more than 10 kilometers. Yeah, I think Ipo is a lot of uh, cement or bricks. Uh, and then we also, we, we also uh, uh, make sure all the construction methods can be done by anyone, even though uh, a bank contractor that can re repay it without a specialist. This is our uh, design uh, directions. And the rovers behind, I study it using a uh, wasm. I, I do a lot of configuration just to do uh, the rovers. Uh, I try to come up with uh, optimum configurations. What is the maximum opening, but minimum risk of uh, rainwater splashing in. In Malaysia, we have a, a we want the natural ventilations, but we have we are. We are in a tropical countries, so rain splashing is our problem. So how do what's the optimum angles? And this is a back of the toilet. Um, in the, at the back of the toilets, we also request uh, we want it to design nicely, neatly, because we want to take care of the user. All the buildings we design, we, we, we ask the questions: who use the buildings? Not the students itself, but the cleaner. The cleaner is the one who spend their time with the toilet, so we want them to have a nice working environment. So if they're happy, right, they will take care of the toilets uh, better, or spend more time to take care of the toilets. So we, we, we also ask the cleaner, you know, what is how the operation line, what's the problem with the existing toilets, uh, and then we design accordingly for them, like they want the store rooms, um, they want the water type just right in front of the, uh, of the doorstep, this is what we uh, try to design for them. And this project being widely reported uh, in the newspaper, uh, actually is, is good because we can educate the public. Uh, today, if you design a toilet with acorn, it's nothing new. But if you design a toilet or building without any acorn, any equipment, that is something new. Um, but another set side is, our grandparents' toilets in Kampong also said well, it's a very passive design in the old days. Uh, just with slowly with the aircon coming in, all the mechanical coming in with four buttons. Actually, we have the ability to design this. This is me. At least I have something to show you. Uh, it's all about uh, understanding on people, on the climate, and uh, uh, pass then we can have a very good passive design. Um, so again, sun, wind, water, orientation trees is all the elements that we 
we play off for the design, passive design, I call it climatic design. And we make the word more, more grand academically, I call it climatic design. Let, move, let, let do a movement, let design the building, refer to the climate, refer to the elements that we already have, we free, and our sun is free, our wind is free, but it's very important uh, which we, we need to respond to them carefully, seriously, because we need to live with uh, nature. Uh, and if, uh, if we want to make a building totally passive, this is the elements that we can use for. So uh, I think that's it with my uh, sharing today. Uh, thank you very much. All right. So moving on to our next sections of the day, I invite Dr. Architect Serena Hijaz, Principal Directors of Hijaz Kasturi Associates and Yamber Hearts, and Deputy Presidents of Malaysia Green Building Council. Known for changing the building landscape or architectures, true buildings that are responsive, energy conscious and bold. So let us welcome her to speak on the topics of ecological value, comforts and contemporary living. This architecture aims to explore different skills using natural materials that consume resources at least. Bringing us back to ecological footprints that ground us to nature while keeping structures in balanced temperatures. Let's look into how can we utilize our natural resources to their best potentials. Let's welcome Dr. Architect Strainer Hijaz. Hi, um, thanks for coming this morning. It's been a bit early. Um, yeah, I thought I, I sort of, you know, flash up some of the projects that I've been, I've had the honor of working on. Um, and although today my topic is actually ecology um, and in terms of the way forward for future, I, I can't say that my past buildings have all been ecological. I wouldn't be bold enough. But most of my buildings um, from the very beginning have been energy efficient. Um, and I, my first building when I came back, uh, I was in the Tall Buildings Conference yesterday, Kutba. And um, I said my first building when I came back at 26 was Telecom Malaysia. And that building basically achieved about 110 BEI, which is 100, it's about 50% less than a typical building built up over, well, I can't tell you, tell you how old I am, um, some time ago. Let's just put it that way. But these are some of the projects that I, I'm sort of proud of. Um, and um, from very tall, I, I seem to be going much lower now uh, in terms of design. Um, so my topic today is really to inspire you um, where I think uh, the next generation of architecture should be going. And the topic is ecology and architecture of the future. This picture is behind uh, our site. Uh, there is a little river um, and it's in uh, what's called the Kasturi project. Um, and it's probably one of the best uh, ideas in terms of ecological architecture in, in its full sense. We've already reached plus 1.5 degrees at Bayan La Paz, Penang. So I don't know what everybody's talking about, but we've already reached that. And um, studies from Think City on the urban heat island is that going forward, uh, what we are going to suffer in, in terms of 2030 is a plus one degree temperature and that the wet bulb will actually increase and humidity will increase and it will be worse in the tropical belt and that uh, heat will be the biggest problem that we'll be suffering, heat stroke. Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about carbon and I, I don't know how to explain it much better to you than to actually explain about how big is our biocapacity footprint. So 
like the good, uh, I'm not a doctor, I've just got to correct that. I've been given an honorary doctorate from uh, Harriet Watt for the Harriet Watt building uh, and for my contribution in sustainability. Um, so I'm not a doctor. How big is your biocapacity footprint? I, I did go in and do my, my own and just one travel to Dubai to have a look at the Dubai Expo project. I exceeded uh, my biocapacity uh, globally. So it just tells you every time you get on the plane, um, the biocapacity increases. However, um, I have 14 acres of indigenous plants and some of the oldest plants that my mother is growing. And also in the Kasturi, we have the, the swamp. So my carbon sequestration is zero. So in other words, whatever I've created, I'm down to zero. Um, so uh, that being said, I think you should all go in and do the biocapacity footprint. Uh, how big is your ecological footprint? Um, and how big is your carbon footprint? And in three projects, I'm going to exemplify because I think um, giving example to what you talk about uh, is really, really important. And then you can see what we're talking about when we talk about biocapacity. So I love this little video and cartoon that's on YouTube. It's called the ecological footprint. Um, and I think it explains it very well. So the ecological footprint is the amount of land and water needed to produce the resources we use when we consume. Um, so when we consume in terms, not only in energy, our clothing, our transportation, all the rest of it, it's, it's ironic we call it ecological footprint because ecological just to me means green, but it means how much we're diminishing. So it's called ecological footprint. And then the biocapacity is how much the earth can actually provide for you, biologically produ productive land available to provide the resources we use or to absorb our waste. Now, when I was born, <clears throat> it's circled at the top, so you can kind of guess how old I am. Um, we were basically with a biocapacity of six times the amount we had. So imagine that in my generation, we are later on, you're going to see um, what that number is. But in your generation, we were actually at just a balance. Malaysia's ecological footprint uh, basically is 3.2 biocapacity, 3.2 ecological, and we were at zero. I'm assuming most of the average uh, age here is my son's age, about 25 years old. So you were at zero, zero at that point, okay? Today, we are at minus two. Today in Malaysia, you are already, say you are earning 3,000 ringgit a month, 5,000 ringgit a month. You are spending $10,000 a month. That means you're borrowing from the bank. That is how much you are using. And so we are minus two. We have this incredible idea that in, in Malaysia, we have abundance of everything. We have abundance of water. That's why in Penang, uh, we have the highest use of water globally in the world in Penang. Um, we have a lot of green. So we can, we can build and do all the things we want to do. But so it's really ironic that we see we are at a biocapacity that is minus two in 2018. So, so much for all the reserves that we think. The only place that doesn't have the minus two and the only place that's going to be saved in 2030 is Canada. So few people, a lot of land. Um, so, and then how do we relate that to carbon footprint? Well, it's your impression or emission on the planet. It's the amount that you're emitting out in terms of release. Um, and at the moment, we're emitting about 60% from that. So um, I often use this slide only because I see, I think that everybody can relate to numbers. I like numbers, but I can see it from the sky. I don't remember when we had the haze, the terrible, terrible haze, and everybody thought that the PPM in the air is really, really bad. Well, it was at 407.25, and that was in um, 2017, okay? We had fantastic blue skies in the pandemic, right? But do you notice that the number went up to 414? So within five years, that number, the PPM is the amount of carbon in the air measured in Mao. It went up to 0 0.7. It means that even though we stopped 
a lot of manufacturing and, the, and, uh, and a lot of transportation, mobility, travel, all the rest for the two years, this number was still going up. And the reason why it's still going up is, it's because it's for all the manufacturing we've done 30 years ago. I have another slide that shows basically if you're looking at the North Pole and where we see the hole, it is basically the outcome of 30 years ago. We are just trying to catch up with time for, for all the carbon that we've released into the air. And so the balance of the planet's resources are used to regenerate new resources. So we need to balance the energy, resources, and most importantly, ecology. Because going forward, we need this ecology to cool down our climate in the bigger scale. So one, the only one feasible pathway, as mentioned by um, the good um, speaker before me, was that we have to look at what I call nature-based solutions. More passive design, yes. Uh, more uh, efficient energy efficiency. Of course, if I'm going to do a low rise building, I can do a lot more natural ventilated. But when I go to a high rise building and it's an office and not a residential, if it's a residential, I can do also a lot of passive design, but I can't do it in an office building that's going up vertically because I, I, we try to do it on Telecom Malaysia. We try to have the, the core would be naturally ventilated. And the, the reason was you can't do it is because of the dust particles and the humidity in our climate. So it's not for lack of trying to get across ventilation in a high rise building. Um, we need to put in more renewable energy. Um, and, and then in the last mile, only in the last mile, sorry, the slides have sort of uh, combined. I think it's the format of the page. But in the last mile, then only do we do carbon sequestration. That is the last mile. We need to do the 50% reduction in terms of energy. We need to do the 50% reduction today, not tomorrow. So I call it climate adaptive and nature-based solutions uh, with increased ecology and biodiversity in your design. That's why everybody's talking about vertical gardens, horizontal gardens. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's what everybody's looking in terms of the architecture. Me personally, I'm not big on vertical greening, but on horizontal greening. You can do it all on top of the buildings, but not the vertical because of the maintenance that's in there. So ecological reducing of our foot footprint, we really start to look at nature-based solutions. I was talking to the good uh, um, to previously that, you know, I wish that we were actually inventing the solar systems um, through a series of photosynthesis because haven't we learned from nature? Um, and that's the idea of biomimicry. Uh, I'm yet to see a building that has been basically designed in the full biomimicry concept. And biomimicry basically is learning from nature and adapting it to your design. So the Kasturi um, is an idea um, by Inchit Hijas for his design. I didn't work on this design, so I've got to be quite clear. Um, it's called Embrace by Land and Sea. Um, and this is the entire site. It has only about 26 units. It's actually built in a, um, a swamp area. Um, and as we all know, the highest sequestration of uh, uh, in terms of carbon sequestration is actually from swamp and is also from um, um, bamboo. Um, so these are the two highest sequestration um, plants that basically can sequester as much carbon. Um, it's by the sea and I can only say that in the past 10 years that we've been there, water has already risen. Um, so much so that we had to actually put this embankment in front to stop the crashing of water coming. And even though we had set back the uh, amount that we were supposed to set back, but the water has been rising. But the most important thing is in, in the design of this was the idea to put less buildings on the site. Now, it, it doesn't work out for you because it's a commercial land and all the green area you have, you're still paying at the end of the year for your tax on commercial land we are penalized uh, for building more green. And instead of giving us an incentive to build more green, um, we've been penalized for it because we haven't recognized that building more green, and if you didn't put more built up area on your green area, um, you could actually get a less tax. 
Um, we've been working with uh, LHDN with regards to incentives on green from the Malaysian Green Building Council. And we're always looking for ways of which to incentivize the developer to appreciate about building less uh, than rather than building more. So it's ob obviously built with indigenous uh, um, uh, materials. Um, wherever possible, it's naturally ventilated. It's got very big eaves. Um, and you can see, I mean, I've sort of, sort of superimposed the plans. It, it, it is not a low cost um, uh, uh, development. Um, one night is XXX amount to stay. Um, but during the pandemic, we didn't suffer. We didn't suffer because it was individual units. They had their own pool. Um, Muslims who go there feel that they can go into their own swimming pool without being noticed by anybody else. So during the pandemic, we survived, um, which we're very grateful for. But as you can see, the canopy of trees were actually shading all the buildings. So uh, even half the building is overshaded by all these trees. Um, and the most important thing to know about trees is that under the cooling shade of natural trees, we get a three to seven degree temperature under trees. Now, one presentation we did when we were actually talking with Maida about trees and cooling is what's the proof? I said, well, hasn't anybody read the Think City uh, Heat Island um, study? Has nobody actually seen the adaptive uh, planning? Already when we did Telecom Malaysia, we already knew that under the trees by uh, uh, Hassan Sunny, the temperature would be three to five degrees cooler. So if we know that the temperature is going to rise another plus one degrees, it's very certain, it's, it's science. Um, then we need to put in more trees to cool down our areas. Um, so there's three, point, three to seven degrees. You increase the immense habitat value of the inland. You protect your seafront um, with the swamp. And so there are a lot of things that you will get out from what I call nature-based solutions. Um, and um, this, of course, is the pictures of the resort. On the resort is 100% indigenous natural species. Um, so whilst I build, my mother is a natural conservationist, she greens. So uh, we often have this argument about how much green are we actually doing? So for this project, she was the client and she said, I don't want you to cut as much trees at all. Um, so there's 90, I would say 90% passive design. We still have air conditioning in the rooms when they want to switch it on. Um, it's 62.2% land area untouched. That means we maintain, as you can see, we've got an elevated walkway going through. And this is Beluka at its very, very best. Um, and, you know, this is kind of views. Sometimes we have the trees popping out of the, of the roofs. Um, and that's basically trying to build in it. And because we are in Nairo, I thought that the materiality context and textures that you see are what is basically influencing the color choices that, um, you know, uh, Nairo seems to be moving into so this sort of natural colors and materials, um, which obviously once we can't uh, uh, afford um, timber and all the rest of it, we, we move into the tiles. And I think tiles are sort of starting to mimic this sort of natural material. So um, raw concrete, brush concrete, wherever possible. Um, the slate, and you can see the slate color is almost close to the river color. And the timber is also close to the, you know, in this kind of light color. So um, choices of material become very important when you're designing in these kind of locations. Chahaya Lank Lankawi is, I think, probably inspired from that. We actually went on to do some, some sort of other competitions called the Durian Resort, as you know, Durian is uh, hyper big. Um, I, didn't want to, I didn't show any of that. But Chahaya Lankawi um, is a resort that we're about to start doing, and it's a high rise. So a high rise and a low rise is totally, totally different. And somebody comes to you and says, I want 150 rooms, and it's, it's really impossible not to think about going vertically. Um, and it's called Beacon at the Sea because it's Chahaya. It's a city for TNB. Um, so they call all their resorts Chahaya. So beside us is this hill mound, uh, and we only have a very narrow front to the sea. 
uh, I'm really happy to say that the initial design that we have here uh, probably went up to about 13 stories, which personally, per, on a personal level, was not very happy um, because we are on a waterfront and a beachfront. Um, it's since then come down to about seven or eight, which I'm much, much happier because what you don't want to do is to impose uh, such a, it makes such an imposition in terms of the building height, especially when you're on the waterfront. Um, but be, because we're squeezed to a very uh, narrow bit, uh, the idea is to use the landscape as a series of wellness for the design. So you can see it's very, very narrow. Um, so, you know, we could have come with just a very narrow block going all the way front, or we could have just done a very square building. Actually, we did a competition inside our office because we are very competitive in our office. Um, we had two. One was doing a slight curve and mound because we said, book it, um, you know, the book it is right next to you. So let's take the profile of the, the book it and we'll, so, so it will merge to see like it's part, part of that. Uh, and then we had this one, which was ascending up client chose the other one so that's okay um but we we were very conscious about the blue green uh aspects of uh the both the water and the hill orientation shading um of course all the walkways to get into the hotel rooms are all naturally ventilated and all the rest of it and and the biggest thing as mentioned before is rain so when you open two sides of a building, you actually get uh, cross ventilation that goes across, which is fantastic, but you also get water. When we did the boating clubhouse in Putrajaya, a very sweet low rise building, like a shell on the waterfront, you can pull out the rowing boats to go out and it really goes into the water. It's, it's really quite a sweet building. We had problems of water coming in. So we had to, had to put glass louvers on the outside uh, to stop the water coming in to the middle of the building because we had cross ventilation. So cross ventilation is uh, an, a, something that we need to respond to in, in the tropical design. So you can see very, very narrow front going front and we want to still get the views um, and all the walls. So this is just a superimposition of the building uh, onto the site. I, I, I always like looking at aerials. Um, what you saw from the Kasturi earlier was an aerial study with the buildings on it. Um, I, I think that's, you know, this is how, how we're moving forward with in terms of technology. Um, and, and this is the building. It's just slightly ascending up and there's a lot of shading on the sides of the building uh, going into the building. Um, and then of course, this is the aspect going into the building itself. So that, that was just trying to say to you that um, the way we build now, we really have to consider at least a minimum of 20% green area, um, uh, not the 10% Kawasan Lapang and all the rest of it. Um, and you'll see from the, a little bit of the snippet of the Penang South Islands, controversial as it may be, um, was the attempt to do a lot of bio uh, in bio design in, in those islands. So bio capacity will be something that we have to think about in cities of the future because we, the nature-based solutions can reduce the risk of uh, floods. We don't have to build all these huge dams and longkangs and all the rest of it. When you can see from Singapore, when they transform Bishan, um, they actually change, you know, you you know, in Klang, that we, ha we all have these big drains that go all the way across town. Well, there are other nature-based solutions that we can do. We can do it in true landscape and allowing for the water to come through. Um, and in fact, Singapore has started to do that. Um, we haven't started to do that. Singapore started to do that only because Singapore is a very small country and, you know, they need to fix everything right in the one spot. Uh, we, we are much more spread out. We are a population of 30 million people. So hence why the negative two. Um, so when we did this, it's just to give you an, a snippet of the PSI, very controversial, of course, because of the uh, rent land reclamation. But just to just tell you that on the southern part of the island from Bayan Lepas, it's fairly shallow, fairly muddy, and the fishing happens beyond this line. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm not saying that it's still better to do, but if the city needs to expand, then do it properly. 
Um, Singapore has already extended its borders. Penang has done it to the north. All cities actually have done it. But if you're going to do it, then try and do it. And that's why this was called biodiversity, because the approach we took was really, really quite different. Not just because of the look. I mean, the buildings go no higher than 20, 25 stories in the entire city. The green area is more than 25%. But around the island was designed that you would actually have still an ecological edge all over the site and going into the water itself. So the ideas about it were ecology, mobility, community, resiliency, and sustainability. And, and really, these are the tenants moving forward when we want to think about reviving, recreating, regenerating our cities. And then we looked at how we could connect all those native blue-greens. So when the Think City study was, it was not so much, you know what was the hottest part of Penang, measuring at 40 degrees in the daytime, was in the middle of Georgetown. Outside Georgetown, on top of the roofs and all the rest of it, it didn't reach higher than 32. But in Georgetown, the old traditional conservation city, it was arriving at 40 degrees when you take a temperature read. So, and what they're doing now is greening the streets and connecting the blue green networks through to shade the city in that cell, because then we can bring down the temperature. Mobility was looked at in terms of getting a much better mobility, therefore bringing less cars down, uh, much more community compact activated mixed use, resiliency using the responsive nature-based future flexible systems and passive integrated smart systems. Um, and out of that, you know, these were the percentages of our target for the master plan. We were really looking already at how we could reduce uh, the two degree reduction in public and private realm, stormwater management parks, um, and all the networks inside the site. A lot of blue green networks planned for the city right from the beginning. And these were the studies around the waterfront and how we would actually revive uh, the areas of the water as well as bring it in inland. We also have the riparian mangrove. So this would be a belt that would be going around the island. The next one is lowering our carbon footprint. So that was the third item. How could I exemplify to you how we could actually low down uh, our carbon footprint? So uh, I know I've shown this once before. Uh, I, sh I looked up my, my presentation to Mala uh, more than uh, two years ago, where we were just starting on the Dubai Expo. But now I have the results from the Dubai Expo. So the Dubai Expo Malaysian Pavilion is the first net zero carbon pavilion in the entire history of Expo. It's the first time we won, Malaysia won a goal award even though it's the smallest pavilion, it won a gold uh, award from Expo. Um, and we were also net zero energy because Expo decided that the, uh, their solar system outside would provide energy called REC for the entire Expo site. So the entire Expo site receive energy for their solar systems outside. We call it the rainforest canopy, touching the ground lightly, and it was to be a metaphor to us basically about making a low imprint. Um, and uh, we were the first to present at the um, program for people and planet at Expo on climate and biodiversity solutions. And we were really fortunate to speak together with um, uh, one of the founders of biomimicry. Um, and it was just a, an amazing experience to, to listen to her about biomimicry. Um, now, the brief given to us is, this is the site. And when you finish, you must return the site exactly how it is. Um, Expos have a bad rap with regards to its temporary structures. It's a lot of money to build and for what? Um, so when we did the design, we were uh, cognizant that we need to recycle all the materials as much as possible. Uh, so what could we build to give us this recycle? Uh, up to 75% of the, the building materials can be recycled after. And all the soil that we took out, we dumped at, in our uh, laydown area uh, quite close, and we were basically to fill it up again. 
The only amount of concrete we had on this building was in the base. Now, we probably made a mistake with that, um, only so because we are competing with Sweden, we're fairly competitive. Sweden also is one of the timber pavilions at Expo, but their basement was made out of timber. They brought 30 trees to the site um, in terms of their columns. So when our columns were up, uh, the CEO kind of looked and said, how come we didn't use timber columns? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> we're never going to win. But I think when you have this idea that you have to return the ground to zero, you have to think about how you want to build differently. And so we, our conscious effort was to lower our footprint um, and to, to have a net zero emission from this building. So we... We are visual animals. We are very um, inspired, inspired on the Malaysians building on uh, stilts, um, what we used to be known for, building on stilts. And maybe we, we will still be building on that when we basically have the water rising, especially on the, on the river areas. Um, but we also wanted to uh, impress on an idea of being in the canopy of trees, um, and that meant what we surround, balancing our energy systems for the building, um, putting forth, I don't know if you know, but in that time we were getting a lot of comments and crit criticism about palm oil, our reforestation and all the rest of it. So we needed to prove to the world about our re reforestation and restoration works that we are doing. Uh, that's one of the examples, for example, uh, on this thing and balancing sustainable plantation. In other words, we do know we need to have plantations, but how can we actually balance that? Yeah. So um, one of our inspirations is this sort of meandering river inspires the passage into the, into the pavilion. As you can see, the passage into the pavilion is this winding uh, road, uh, winding uh, route going up into the pavilion. So it's sort of mimicking going through the river and there's landscapes on either side. Uh, so we have a water feature in the front uh, where we have uh, some cooling where people have to wait. Um, and then we had these greeneries and pockets and sunken garden to bring light down into the space. The client gave us three times the amount of area or space that we had to do. So we went underground uh, and created this sort of courtyard space. It is a tiny, tiny site. It is one of the smallest pavilions at Expo. Going to, um, uh, uh, going to Japan, uh, the next Expo will be Japan, the site will be three times this for the Malaysian pavilion. So get in there. Um, land and architecture concept was really important to us. Now, if we want to talk about passive design, we're not going to be able to do it when we are doing all the exhibitions are all internal, what I call a black box. Yeah. So you see this meandering route that comes into the pavilion, very organic uh, buildings. Uh, we use a Maranti. So the, the floor, walls, ceilings are all in timber. Um, the structure is the combination for the staircase in concrete at the very minimum. So we minimize where we use the concrete. We use the steel and all the steel is to be recycled after. Um, holding the pavilion in the front, we call them the chopstick uh, uh, columns. Um, this is uh, on the roof itself. We do have some PV um, and as you can see uh, the site. Uh, in section, it was basically at the ground floor, you can basically move around the pavilion and then uh, everything is elevated or there's one sunken floor. Um, you know, some, some of the sketches. Um, the columns are metaphor for trees. Um, we didn't want to bring trees, trunks into this location. Um, and also they light up a little bit with uh, lights to appear like fireflies at night. So the metaphor of fireflies uh, in that sense. So they sort of light up. And indeed, from a distance, you can see these poles with little lights that are going. Um, these are some of the exhibition. It's called uh, Sustainable Commodities. Uh, and then we um, obviously had quite an experience of, uh, um, we had Formula One um, come, what's his name, um, to, to the expo because uh, Petronas was one of the, uh, sponsors for the cube, um, and, and that was such an honor. These were our deflection diagrams, studying how much deflection and optimizing. So I've got to say that 
our in, in the way forward will be in digi doing digital architecture to basically optimize on the amount of material you use for this building. In fact, this building has a little bit of what I call excitation and um, the Dubai engineers uh, really, really didn't like that. The walkway is supposed to shake a little bit, um, but um, uh, that didn't go down well with them. So these were some of the structure uh, things. But we also take a, uh, we calculate the amount of concrete, the amount of steel, uh, the amount of reinforcements, the amount of timber, because we actually, later on, you're going to see that we study the amount of embodied uh, energy, which is all the material to construct and build, and the amount of operational energy, which is what they're using now to calculate your carbon. So some pictures of where we're using the steel to the optimum, uh, where we have in terms of the timber. And so what was the moves that we made for the embodied carbon is a lightweight structure, sustainable timber facade, in other words, is PFC certified timber, uh, the steel structure to be recycled, the base concrete is with fly ash, 75% of the material deployed on decommissioning, um, and the land will go to zero. Now, we're very, very lucky. We've been chosen to be part of the legacy, and the pavilion will stay up for another five years. And Aerodyne, the guys who do the um, uh, aerial photography thing, they are taking over the building. They're one of the largest in the world now, the Malaysian company that sport Dubai and America's uh, 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 drone, uh, drone companies, and uh, they will be based in this building. So on the operational carbon, what did we do? We reduced by 10% uh, on the uh, energy with solar PV. That's all the space we had. Uh, we, we wish we could do more. We had energy efficiency of about 25.7 and a portable water of 85%. And combined, uh, we were also getting the rec from uh, energy outsides, which made it zero. So this is just a, a, a drawing showing the experience inside the canopy. But these are the actual planning of the construction and operational stage. Now, a lot of companies now will have to be do, start doing their journey to what's called the ESG. And they're looking at scope one, scope two, scope three, and they're calculating um, uh, their ESGs. Um, this is what they will be starting to do for their companies. Uh, especially now in Bursa, making it requirement uh, for ESG uh, reporting. So we did the calculations, uh, uh, and then these were the actuals. So you can see we estimate about, uh, if you look down, this figure here is about 1,510 tons CO2e. Imagine this pavilion is only 1,240 meters square. It's small. So you can imagine what the embodied and operational would be of a shopping center. Basically, this is like a house, a, a, a big house. Um, and um, the, these were some of the reductions. So as I said, um, if I were to compare uh, how much land would be the equivalent of the embodied and operational energy, it'd probably be 73 hectares a year. So it's only 1,240 meters square. Again, I'm telling you this. So when you start to think about big buildings, when you start to see these kind of numbers, then you understand the gravity of what we are doing and how we build. Um, it's the winner of Rethinking the Future this year, um, which we are... Um, uh, amazingly uh, happy uh, with that. Um, in terms of materiality, uh, you know, I was trying to say, do I have a good desert picture? The other one's a bit yellow. Well, actually, this is the soil we dug out on the day of the groundbreaking, and I didn't see that the color of the sand and the color of the timber is almost the same. Um, so in terms of a net zero carbon and energy, uh, we had 1,528 ton CO2 equivalent. Um, we had 1.2 million visitors in six months. You don't even get that for a shopping mall. 
So it's a lot of people that had to go into this building. Um, it's 25.7 uh, energy reduction, 12.1% softscape on site. Uh, we couldn't get as much as I said. It's a very tiny site. And then renewable energy, about 16 kilowatts. So what is the future that everybody keeps talking about? Everybody keeps talking that the future will be that we'll be growing our cities and building timber buildings. Um, these are some of the examples of 18-story building, 18 stories, there's two there that are about 18 stories, and some that are planning buildings that are about 30 stories. I wouldn't say they're all timber, I would say they're hybrid um, due to fire, but also not so much to the fire, but uh, due to the um, strength uh, and materiality. So they're, they're moving towards cores that are either steel and concrete and then the, the floors, ceilings and walls. Um, but it was a question I posed to uh, the structural engineer yesterday at the Kutba with regards to using tropical trees. Um, so tropical trees behave quite differently from uh, European trees. Um, and so we have issues in terms of how we're going to do that. So please be part of the commitment um, to move towards nature-based solutions um, and increase the amount of greenery that we have on our side, because this is the only way that's going to cool down our environment as a whole. Thank you. Right, with that, I would like to invite Jasmine Yap, Products Marketing Marketers at Nairo Ceramic Groups to give our her speech. Hi, good morning, everybody. So is everybody ready, ready? Yes? Okay, so I believe all of you have been uh, going through a very fruitful morning. So I'm Jasmine, the product marketer for Nairo Granite. First of all, um, I would like to share with you on my, my speech today about the sustainable uh, movement of towels. All right. So commonly known in the market that you know about ESG, but what does it refer to? So definitely we are looking into a much more um, environmental and also in terms of the uh, social governance implementations, whereby we look at also the waste uh, management, the energy and also the resource usage that actually leaves an impact for our environmental and social aspects. Right. So with the three R framework actually in place, it actually wants we actually wants to actually bring a much more greater sustainability, whereby we want to look at reducing energy and also our resources consumptions in terms of our raw materials that we put in to produce our goods today, and also how we can reuse it and finalize, uh, finally recycling it. So here's the problem about the waste today that we have. Out of 85% of those uh, waste that we produce globally, which actually at the end lands in the landfill, actually out of it, 34% is generated from the construction and also the de demolition works. So here, when the waste actually goes to landfills, you can see that methane gas and even... Um, Methane gas and also our carbon is actually produced. So we made these major contributors to um, a lot of issues, such as like the greenhouse emissions and also our climate change. You can actually have a feel on how it is impacting us today already. So in the recent years, we saw that consumers are getting wiser. They actually learned that um, the environment plays a very important uh, role to us because 85% have of them have started buying more sustainable uh, products. And they find that 34% of consumer is willing to pay at a much higher price as long as the product is sustainable. So this signifies that 
producers and manufacturers today, um, we have to learn that consumers are putting sustainability first, right? So when it comes to towels, because towels, as you know, it can be very durable and it also can be very long lasting as long as like um, one of our speaker mentioned earlier, it can last up to 70 years and you can still reuse it or even um, re repick it for, for recycling purposes. So here we can see that with these features of towels, it actually helps the customers to reduce their use by having lesser replacement of, of them in the renovations or even um, the commercial space that we are in today. So sometimes we also ask ourselves whether or not do we need special chemicals to clean the tiles. Most of the time, as you know, tiles at home or even commercial space Soap and water is already doing um, their best and it's just fine for the cleaning. So we, when we actually reduce the um, use of too much of chemical in um, cleaning our towels, this one also reduces the use of those type of, um, those type of chemicals that are leaving an impact to our environment. Okay, so in Nairo Ceramic Group today, we are committed to actually achieve a greater sustainability, whereby our cotton box today for packaging, we are using much more eco-friendly and also biodegradable products. Besides that, conservation of energy in a lot of factories, usually we use solar power. In Nairo Ceramic, we do have also. But besides that, we do use natural lights. Like today, we have all our window frames high enough to actually bring it natural lights to our showroom, okay? And then we also conserve our water in terms of our sanitary wear by adopting the orange Dino Flush technology. So this also in terms help our customers to reduce the use of the water at home and even in the public areas. As one of our main efforts that we have done in the year of 2020, we actually introduced one of the surface, which is called slip stop. So what does this slip stop do is that this surface itself is able to be in, um, applied to multiple um, areas, such as the wet areas, outdoors, or even um, the internal areas, which meets diverse needs of our customers. Then there comes the questions. Can we actually do more to be much more sustainable? Here, we are proud to say that we can actually do more because Nairo Granite is one of the first in the Malaysian market that are introducing our Slim series, which is super light and also super thin. So how does we actually refer to the super light and also the super thin? In our features. Mainly it's because we want our slim series um, to have a carbon footprint in our, our, our efforts today in sustainability. With the super light and super thin, you can see that there's a 35% less raw materials actually used in producing the slim series. So we use lesser natural resources and also the energy. Next will be to create a much more, um, more secure workplace for the workers that are in the construction line. So we actually, with the super light weight, with over um, one kilogram per square foot, it is much more easily um, being transported by the workers and also being installed um, during their, during their um, installation for the renovation. Besides, when you look at the carton box that we are using today for the Slim series, because it's thin, so we can pack a few uh, more tiles into a carton box at one go. And this also reduces the packaging that we used. With the fuel saving um, features that we have, whereby during the transportation with the light tiles and also uh, fewer carton box used, we can actually achieve um, fuel saving 
when we are transporting them to the project sites. Right? So taking a load off from the earth with the thin and light features of the SLIM series, we believe that we can actually create lesser sinking issues after the structure is complete because of the weight. This one also, we are working on the tile on tile application because usually we talk about hacking works that are that we create much more um, disposals. So with the tile and tile, tile on tile concept, we can actually reduce the air and also noise pollution. Reason being is the, because we can uh, avoid hacking and also reusing the existing tiles, just maintain them there. So here are the three key takeaways for our SLIM series. With the thin and lightweight, with the eco-friendly and also the ways to make renovation easier. Today, Slim, with the Slim series, we believe that sustainability for the tile industry can be taken into a next level. Here I'm showing you three different designs. When we are talking about sustainability, we always say that it could be very raw and sometimes it could be even boring. But for tiles, that's another case. Reason being is because our design today, it could be simple, it could make a statement, or it can be unique also. Here we are looking at three different designs. We have the simple one, which is the first one, we call it Atmos. The second one, which we are creating a statement in the space that we are going to design, which is Breeze. And lastly, we are creating a unique design of, um, of mimicking the urgent limestone, which is gust. For all three designs, we have it in only one, um, one sizes, which is 60 by 120 cm. And then we also give you the flexibility of having it in two different surfaces, which is both polished and also matte. But matte is only for atmos and gust. To make it more natural, we also have our tiles in five different fixed phases. So here you can actually view it physically in our showroom today because we have actually um, display all the phases which is available over that over the left side of the showroom. So here I'm showing you all the available phases. The first one is Atmos, then followed by Breeze. And then the last one is gust. So with this, we also would like to um, share with you and bring you on a virtual showroom tour, which could help you to understand further on the concepts that you can apply and even the areas that you can actually look at. Here's a QR code appearing on the screen currently. You can actually scan it. Okay, I will just stop 10 seconds here for you to scan the QR code. Okay, can everybody um, uh, um, scan it? Or are we having... Yeah, is this screen appearing on your phone right now? Yeah? Okay. All right. As you walk through the virtual showroom, let me summarize the space for some of you if you are not able to scan it on your phone. Okay, I'll leave another five more seconds. Right? Okay, so moving on, then let me walk you through the showroom. Okay, the first place that we are looking at is a living area whereby we combine um, our Atmos with other building materials even. You have the flexibility to match it with a, um, a wood 
uh, de design panels or even your furniture. So here we are displaying at most in both the feature wall and also the wall, uh, the floor area. You can see that with these simple tiles, it actually enhances your entire area, making it simple, but at least the design is much more needed. Second one, if you like to create a statement in your commercial area, here is Breeze, whereby we are displaying, displaying it in the reception area on the wall side. So this will actually capture a glimpse of your, um, your guests and also your audience that when they are walking into the space. The next one is an application in the dining area because dining area, usually you would like to have a much more cozy and also warmer feel. So we have Breeze displaying in the dining area at the floor. So this is one of the combination that you could go for. Right. And then if you are thinking to refurbish your leaf area, to save your time and also saving your cost of the hacking, you can do a tile-on-tile -tile, um, tile -tile concept whereby you can apply our breeze or even all our other design in your leaf interior for both floor and also the wall. So why do we actually go for the size of 60 by 120? Usually the beauty of 60 by 120 or sizes even larger than it actually have lesser grouting lines. This will actually help you to elevate the space and make it look even much more catchy. Yep. All right. So moving on to the kitchen area, whereby we are looking at a much more clean and also a much more needed um, space. Here we have our Atmos displayed on the floor. And then you can opt for Gas to be applied as your kitchen backsplash and even the island countertop. So this will be one of the options. And then lastly, we can actually look at the elegant and also luxurious feel type of concept where we have our Atmos and Gas appearing on both the bathroom area, floor and also wall. Okay, so with that, I will leave my speech here today. And then I hope that you all have an uh, understanding on the TALS um, sustainability movement that we are aiming for. If you have any information on the series or even certain products that you are looking at, do stay tuned to our social media for the um, applications. While going to the website also, we'll share more information on our brand and series. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Please be seated on the stage. I kindly invite architect Hui Jong Wai, Managing Director of Asia Design Architects and Remember Hearts, and Dr. Architect Shrinder Hijaz, Principal Director of Hijaz Castry Associates in Remember Hearts and Deputy President of Malaysia Green Building Council, to the stage to join for our moderation section. So before this, uh, I would like to initiate this, right, while waiting for the questions, right. Uh, as there is a growing um, realization to change the conventional development space to sustainability, so where well, climate play a very important uh, role in architectures and um, building forms. Right? So architect Jong Wei, right, what are your strategies in designing uh, well-ventilated spaces? Oh, I mean the strategies for well ventilations. Yeah, well ventilated spaces. Spaces. Mm. Um, it's all about science. Um, if you understand how the wind work, the, the ventilation is work by pressure. So we have to create the positive pressure and negative pressure. I'm sorry it's so scientific, but it's something very natural. Uh, for example, in our projects, our you know, one condo projects, we are trying to, uh, because it's long typologies, so we want the cost ventilations cross through the whole lobby. In order for us to do that, 
then we have to create a big gap and small gap in between. Um, so we we are active. I mean, purposely make uh, create the pressure uh, for the wind so that enough momentum and energy to pull the wind in the inner core, and then um, and then they flow through the whole corridors. Uh, if we if we if we notice nowadays a lot of condo uh, they put the staircase in end to end. Actually, this is something not so friendly to ventilations because we block the ventilations. Mm -hmm. um, in one of our projects, actually, we, we successfully designed a staircase inside the building, high-rise building, and we lift empty to the side by side. It's simple. Ventilations, you just need two opening, end to end. Then you can create the cross ventilations. And if you understand how the pressure works, uh, then you can create uh, ventilation as well. well. So these are strategies uh, we, we always use. Very well, good. Thanks for the input. Yeah, very technical. Right. And there's also some police you want to share with us, you know, so what is the green building misconceptions that normally people think? My question again is it? Yeah, it's your question. Oh, misconception of uh, green buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, green buildings is more expensive than uh, normal buildings. This is a very misconception. Uh, we, we, we want to make green affordable. I don't know what's the price of the slim series. I, <laughs> I hope your less material use, the price will be cheaper than. Uh, Previous series, mm -hmm. I think that's a concept. Yeah, so we 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 uh, uh, the no. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't asked the price yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so this is a misconception because uh, every time we chop the green labels, the product sell uh more in price. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think maybe people used to it and and people have a misconception. Uh. A inverter aircon have the more expensive, uh, green electricity car have the more expensive. Uh, I think not the mis misconception, not just the, the public, the, the consumer, but also our creator, designer, architects. When we talk about green buildings, immediately in our mind, this is more expensive. I think this concept is, is have to revert, mm -hmm. yeah, to make the green more affordable in the movement. Yeah. So, yeah, I, this think one. So. I have to correct that misconception as well. Um, uh, uh, look, if you build a kampong house, mm -hmm. it is more expensive to build now because of timber, mm -hmm. right? Okay. But it's naturally ventilated and it has the overhangs. And on some days it's going to be warmer. But the, the person who lives in the kampong, if they have a kampong house, the, for the person who lives in the kampong, the best thing they can do is insulate their roof. And that'd be the only cost that they'd have to do because to keep their um, shelter cooler. There's 5,000 homes being built near Perak for uh, B40s, single dwellings. Built very fast, very quick, very low. But I bet you there's no insulation on the roof. So if there was only one thing to do, insulate your roof, especially when we know the climate is going to go higher. If you can, have an overhang. But green buildings in 500 projects at Green Building Index, when we studied, the incremental cost for being certified, if you're doing whatever you need to do, um, is only 1% to 3%. And your payback is within three, three years. So, um, you know, somebody just said they put solar, their payback was 36 months. So it's a misconception. Yes, very uh, true. When we first start, coming back to the slim, when we first start having dual flush, it was seemed to be more expensive. Now it's common, dual flush, low, low flushing, it's all common already. Paint, we didn't have the paint, so it's, it's supply and demand. Coming to electric cars, we asked we wondered why Proton didn't even start with electric cars five years ago. That's because their market was selling to Africa and all the rest of it. There is no 
there is no market for that electrical cars. But now they're behind time. So and everybody is doing the electrical cars. So uh, it, the the first person to do it is going to be a little bit more expensive. So Slim is here. It's going to be slightly more expensive. But within the year or two, it probably normalize because people will be buying it because it's reduced material or um, you know it, it can span uh, large spans. You can put it on all the rest of it. So I think we've passed that. It's it is not more expensive to go green. In fact, as he, he first said, it is more expensive not to go green. Indeed. Thanks for the sharing, sir. Serena. Right. Uh, as, as we know, right, uh, it's very important to create the awareness and understandings about sustainability and the advantage benefits behind it as well. So you will, in a way, that to promote it. So as a consultant, right, or as a developer, uh, even the manufacturer, the manufacturers uh, uh, industry, I think uh, all of us actually play a very important role too for the implementations of our sustainable buildings. Maybe Miss Jasmine Yaps, do you want to share your thought on this? Okay, so um, just now I think all of you are mentioning less raw materials. It could be, um, it, the price could maybe be lower, but definitely that's a way to look at it also. Because without the hacking cost for your materials, and then also just the tile on tile concept, we did a survey and the saving can go up to 55%. So without disposal, you can still save your time of your renovation. You can still save your costs in terms of your hacking. So definitely there's still a chance to, to like um, being cost effective. Yeah, so that's part of the investment that you are going to look at. All right, thank you, Jasmine. Okay, uh, Dr. Akhtex Rina Hijaz, right, so from your presentations, it's important to reduce the ecological uh, footprints and to be sustainable, right? So let's take a closer look to the city uh, context. Could you tell us more about um, how can the cities reduce their ecological footprints using uh, natural resources from the role of uh, government's bodies, NGO and communities? It, it's it's a hard one. I, I've I've looked at Shah Alam and Subang Jaya's SDG reports. Mm. Um, there's all a lot of other social aspects that they have to uh, approach. You know, there, there's um, there's a lot of other social elements in the ESG. There's not just the environmental, but they also have social and governance issues that they need to attack. So I think. Of course, on a you know being biased, I would say please look at the environment and sustainability. But when I look into it, they they have a lot of other you know housing, crime, things like that that they have to actually bring down, just as much as they have to bring down uh, you know when we talk about environmental stuff. So um, I I think they are making strides. Of course, more is better, and anybody says, and the time to act is now. Mm -hmm. um, but all these municipalities are cognizant of it already. And they are, I, I, it's quite interesting, instead of saying 2030, there's, uh, there's, their plans are 2025, you know, they, they are shortening their re rebooting, shall I say, re-looking re at all the aspects that they have to, uh, address in terms of environmental social governance. Um, so I think it'd be a, a bit unfair to sort of say, well, why aren't you focusing, focusing on this? There's a lot of incentives. I mean, Penang is thriving and I think Johor as well. We had the two mayors uh, talk about um, what are they doing you know, in terms of environmental. Um, so they, they're trying to give incentives to the developers, you know, by I, sometimes it's higher plot ratio, Sometimes it's reduction of tax. If you're a green building, uh, green development will give you incentive on your tax. Uh, so, and then they're going to tax on waste. Uh, interesting. So it's a bit like reversing things where they don't have to do too much, but give some incentives or disincentives in order to get the, the industry to move in the same direction. 
That's what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. So basically, they encourage the industries to participate in um, green uh, buildings, right? So, right. So, would there be any um, futures or collaborations between the public and private sectors? Um, yeah, I, I think um, um, bigger developers are looking um, seriously. Some have a bigger green agenda. Um, you know, Gamuda has a, a big green agenda, green parks uh, agenda. So they, uh, they're trying to show it in that way that, you know, if we, if we are putting in more parks in our housing areas, etc., um, giving much better environments. It's a good selling point as much as it is good for the environment. So uh, I think those kind of transitions uh, are happening. Yeah. All right. That's great. Okay. Thank you for the comprehensive sharings. So Ms. Jasmine Yard, you have mentions of three our frameworks, all right, reduce, reuse, and recycle, right, to achieve a greater sustainability in construction material industry. So from your point of view, how do the material selections and designs affect the long-term impacts as also from the uh, cost benefits? Probably you can um, also explain or elaborate about the durabilities of narrow slim granite tiles. Okay, so when we are actually selecting the materials, we definitely look a lot into the quality um, side of our Nairo tiles. Mainly it's because, um, as you all know, Nairo, we always mention on the Swiss quality tiles. So during our selections, such as like the Slim series, we are looking at a breaking strength of averagely 1,100 Newton. So 1,100 Newton, when we are talking about commercial indoor or even residential indoor, when you place it on a tile on tile, it is still durable enough for use to use. So not only it's thin, it's still durable. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your sharing. Can you yeah. use it not tile on tile? Yes, definitely. So let's begin with the first questions. Do you have any questions from the floor? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I have one question for Architect Ashu, which is since you said that GBI is like so important and you are an educator yourself, so I think that is it possible that we implement the GPI standard inside the student educations like studio? Like it's like one of the mark assessment, the GPI standard. <laughs> because you see, the green building is like uh, the sustainable for, it's like for the future. And then we have fire safety. So it's like kind of like a safety for us in the future. GBI, you're talking about GBI yeah. only. Yeah? Not only GBI, like some kind of mark assessment. Mark assessment. In green, green building assessment or yeah, tool okay. or something. So, so we don't focus on GBI. Right? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your question. So is, uh, shall we put this as an assessment, part of the basic assessment for studio in the school? Uh, I teach in Taylor for nine years. Um, I'm also one of the uh, one of the lecturers who initiate the green modules in, in the university. Uh, yes, every studio they put this is uh, one of the basic criteria of marking, uh, but I, I don't think uh, it's, this is the only thing we look at in the studios. Uh, personally, I'm very against to put a marks to check how many footprint you you in your building, and then we give you a mark in the studio. Uh, because personally, I I think all these assessment tools is keep evolve. You see, even though green mark GBI or green RD or there are many assessment tools in the in the industry. So which one we have to follow? This is an argument in in the academic. First thing. Secondly, we don't we don't limit the students on imaginations because there's many ways to do it green. There are many perspectives to do it green. So we don't want to make it as a 
assessment tools, like a checklist. It's very dangerous if we use, let's say, for example, GBI as a, our checking uh, criteria because in the future, the student will lack of independence uh, uh, you know, thinking. They just follow a checklist, then you will blindly lead by if something is wrong, you just follow. So uh, I think I, I, I discussed these questions to one of the architects, prior architects, uh, Dr. Ken Yang. Um, you see, nowadays we have to emphasize on all these data and numbers and end up, right, all the buildings eventually look like the same, even though computer can design for you nowadays. The OTTV versus the wall window ratios. Actually, if you just follow that, all the building will be very simple. Then, is that the world that we are looking for? I don't think so. We 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 want to train our student in these directions. But the awareness, yes. Knowledge, yes. This is my answer. Maybe Doctor Sanina. I I agree. I I don't start a design. I have all these things at the back of my mind, but I don't start a design with that. I start a design with what is the identity and what is the concept and what, what, what is the outlook that I want to get. And then I start to peel back the other components I have to consider. Basically, those are just tools. So I think what you are saying is environmental studies, touching on everything from passive to water to... Um, circularity to uh, so that they, they become part of the studies, not so much the tool itself, but components of the tool that define site planning, for example, you know, what, what, how do you approach the site? Um, how do you get the natural resources to work for you? Um, yeah, those fundamentals, yes. Uh, the tools are, as he says, they are evolving. Next year, probably, we will have health and wellness and a a bit of other elements inside there, um, but it won't. It evolves, but the elements of the of the tools are important. That's why we had like six criteria: site sustainability is your approach to your site. Maybe we should have called it passive design instead of active systems instead. But we have EE. But actually, if you if you don't have to use any energy, you are automatically achieving your EEs anyway you'll be energy efficient. So um, I think it's just the environmental sector. And I agree with you that the schools should have environmental studies. Perhaps that's the better word to use. Yeah. All right, thanks. Helps your answer, uh, question is answered. So. To, to add one more thing, uh, actually, I mean, the student nowadays, they do site analysis. And one of the basic criteria is they will do sun path diagrams, wind rose diagrams. Yeah, this is like a package in the site, site analysis. However, if I ask the questions, hi students, can you show me how the sun, what's the sun angle at 12 o'clock in June? They can't answer that. Uh, hi students, may I know in your how do you utilize the data like wind rose diagrams into your design? No one can answer. So um, uh, actually, a, a lot of times we, we do presentation, just a surface. You put the uh, sun path diagrams, it just show I know the sun path diagrams, but uh, indeed you, you don't know what is this and you don't know how to use it. I, I think that that, that that we want to change in our education uh, uh, systems. We, we want to uh, we want the student really understands what you are doing, but not just show off all the data on your board. Hey, thank you for that, sir. That uh, strainers and oops, there's another questions, right? Uh, Good morning. Uh, I have a question for both our architects. Um, it's always awesome to have a lot of greens around the building because it you know, lowers uh, ambient temperature, increases oxygen to the atmosphere. 
But when you have a lot of greens, you will also have a lot of mosquitoes. Even if you do not have stagnant water, mosquitoes will still breed amongst the plants, especially if you have dense planting. So how do you overcome the problem of mosquitoes when you really would like to have you know, dense planting around your building? Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Maybe can I... Yeah. Um, what time of the day do mosquitoes come? So they come twice a day. No, it's true. They, they don't come all the day. They come, they, they come at specific times. Um, I don't know. Our experience um, um, at Rimbun Dahan is that we have grass and the trees are a little bit further away. Um, they give the shade, but we don't have any high bushes or bushes close to the house. We actually push them slightly to the perimeters a little bit. Um, so strategic planting, you're right. Um, we're, we definitely have a mosquito issue generally. Um, in Singapore, they breed, they breed specific mosquitoes. They have tempered with the mosquitoes. Yes, they have. Um, so uh, that's happening in Singapore. Um, but um, planting has to be a bit strategic. You're right, in the tropics. We have, whilst we want the shade, so it's not so much the big trees that are actually bringing the mosquitoes, it's the shrubs. So that's why, like in Rimbu Dahan, where my parents live, the shrubs are all to the perimeters away from the house. Okay. Um, and we have more of the grass, and then the tree canopies are there. So you have to be aware that you're going to do that, basically. Right, thank you. Maybe I'll yeah, pass to you. Uh, I like this question very much because one of the concepts or perceptions of public, when we do a very thick a green wall, and then I ask my wife, do you like a green wall in your house? They say, no, please. Why? They say mosquito, they have bugs. Grasshopper. Yeah. I like green, but I don't like bugs. Okay. I like trees, but I don't like monkey. All right. Actually, this is something that we, uh, uh, from my perspective, right, we've forgotten how to deal with nature. We don't know how to deal with nature. We don't know how to deal with a um, mosquito. So we have to close our room and, and on the aircon. Uh, but when I think about it, right, how the grandparents' uh, life like? Uh, why people like to camping? You know, I believe our humankind, right? We know how to live in nature, just that we are too long contained in uh, this unnatural world. So when we touch a nature, right, we feel nervous. If you're so used to a grasshopper, it's not an issue. You're so used to the bugs, right? It's not an issue. It's just part of your life part of the environment, uh, just that we are too protective since young. This what, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we will in the future have to adopt putting mosquito screens. Mm. You know, it's actually it quite normal be, yeah. in, in uh, Australia that you would have, because of the flies, right? You have actually screens. Mm -hmm. They have sliding screens. Um, and maybe this is part of our language for our new houses that we want it ventilated. We have the screen, allows some air to come through, but not the mosquitoes. So we, we should adapt that lifestyle. Yes. When, we in, when you're in Italy, they have these roller shutters that come down because why in the summer it gets so hot? They actually have to have the windows and they have this, you pull it with the lever. I've never seen it before, but every house um, has this little lever that they bring a shutter down to cut down the heat that's coming into the houses. So, you know, the language of our houses may be in plus one degree where heat, humidity, mosquitoes may even be more, we may have to adapt to doing those kinds of things in our home. So, you know, just having the glass screen, we would actually have to yes. have this netted screen. Yeah, yeah that, I apply that may be the future. Yeah. Yeah. Not in the future, I, I think we can do it now. Like my, my condo, I, I use net, mosquito net. Uh, like we, we have one project in the Jung, uh, in the Jangda bite, very natural. 
but the client, uh, the owner worry that snake stick inside, right? So all the windows they have a uh, the brush to and, and conceal the gap, yeah, the, the bottom. So this is some some technology or some uh, building materials that we should invent for to adapt to this kind of natural environment, uh, because we we don't put enough effort on this research. Uh, therefore, uh, today components materials is not suitable for natural uh, design environment. A, a more modern way to think of it is in apartments. You can have monsoon windows. Yeah. Um, they have it in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. There's only one building in Singapore by Woha that has monsoon windows. We're basically on a high-rise building, but you want to ventilate and have it open. And they basically, it's, it's allowing the air to come through on the underside by flapping up. Oh, very interesting. So these are all the things. Monsoon windows, from the word monsoon, is definitely from the tropics. So we should be um, putting in all these kind of things that are responding to the climate. Yeah, responding views and adapts to the environments and climates. Yes, uh, right. like, like I went to Langawi recently. There, 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 there are a lot of greens in Langawi Islands, but one problem is there are a lot of monkeys along the road and there are a lot of accidents, whether the monkey die or the motorcycle in, cyclist injured. Actually, the solution is quite simple. You just build an eco bridge or eco link, let the monkey can cross the road safely they, they won't get on the street well the eco bridge actually they've been applied in india in japan you know let the animals they can cross over because when we build a road we will cut through the forest we cut through actually the animals that still want to cross over yeah maybe the family is on another side so this is the solutions that we we need to apply to, to mitigate uh, i mean the concerns you are talking about yeah all right Thanks for the, all those um, informations and inputs, my panelists. So we will take the last two questions. And there's are questions from our uh, virtu virtual audience. Right. The question is addressed to architect Serena. Right. The question is, as we want to encourage the use of tropical woods, do you know, is there any ongoing plans to engage governments or trade associations to ensure the sustainability of our forests at the moment? Can you share your insight with us? Yeah, I, I um, th there's a lot, there's a lot to do with the timber council, I think, mm -hmm. and and working on sustainable timber, especially when you start to look at all the details on forest reserve. What is actually forest reserve? What is actually reserved? Um, these are two elements. When I went into study before I gave a talk for the timber council. There are a couple of states that uh, refuse to um, register the reserve uh, on on the website. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it hasn't it hasn't become mandatory uh, the importance of of these reserves. I think um, so. Whilst there are some strives, I cannot say there isn't. Um, that they we need to our best natural resources is our timber and our forests. Mm -hmm. uh, I always said that, and that's what I always have done for the um, Dubai, Dubai Expo. I was lucky to do the Milan Expo. That was pure luck, both competitions. Promoting the idea of our rainforest. Uh, that's our biggest asset. Going forward mm -hmm. in the world, when resources are going down, that's our biggest asset. So if we can um, really increase, maintain our biodiversity, which is reported that 53% of land is actually uh, forest. Um, but if we go down to the 53%, um, because it actually has come down from the last COP to this COP, um, we really need to take a closer look and um, build a buffer for ourselves, yeah. Yes, thanks. Indeed, right, as we are in a tropical country. So that, that's another question. Um, it's, this question is from Imran. So how to keep ecosystem friendly when it comes to coastal areas, developments, or any other sensitive area, especially during construction stage? So maybe architect Jongwai, you want to go first? All right. The question sounds, how to get 
keep ecosystem friendly when it comes to coastal area developments. Yeah, by the sea. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, you know, there's a fantastic website that you can go in and it can show you what happens at one degree, 1.5 degree. It shows how much water, it shows Malaysia where how much water will be coming. It's all in the area of Bayan La Paz and all the rest of it because it's pretty low lying. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we're doing PSI, we have to plan for 150 years ahead. The platform levels are already at the 1.5 degree or two degree change. Basically, we had to lift up the levels yeah. um, to mitigate that. And then the second is the swamp area is a great protection to your coastal line. Mm -hmm. And so basically keeping this green belt of 20 to 30 meters around your perimeter um, is the best way to basically mitigate the climate change. Um, so whilst we've had these kind of setbacks, you know, you can't help that you want to have your hotels in the front, but I think you have to look at the densities. I always say the density should be lower in the front, higher at the back. Mm -hmm. But where, when you're in Hong Kong, obviously that's not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're in Singapore, you can almost say it's the same thing. And Penang is the second Singapore, if, if I was to sort of say, of 20 years ago. It's going down that way. So um, I wouldn't be building really high rise right on the waterfront. I would be pulling them back a little bit from the edges. But yeah, you, you have to make sure you've got proper riparian. And basically in New York City at, the very, at this time, they're building something called the Big U. Mm, yeah. And the Big U is designed to mitigate flood and water rise. So they're in the construction of that because they estimate uh, what's going to happen is is under construction at the moment. Mm. So cities like Bangladesh, um, like what we've just been seeing from Pakistan, from the the rain and the floods. So you just imagine those kind of floods happening in Pakistan. Unfortunately for them, the construction of the buildings are lightweight, and so they get uh, moved. Uh, we we build a little bit harder, but we can expect more of that happening yeah. for us as well. Yeah, especially um, the soil is you know, spicy. It's also considered softer, right? It's probably not suitable to build a high-rise building. So, well. okay. Thanks for all the questions and answer. Let's have another question from our architect, Asli, co-chairman of Education Committee. All right. So yeah, it's a good uh, talk by today by two of you panels. So I'm a co-chair of education in PAM, also a lecturer in University of Putra Malaysia. So one question for all. What motivates you all that you all want to practice this green building and green living? Number one. And number two, how to motivate? Because all of us from here are mainly students. How to motivate the student to practice this green living. So two questions, what motivates you and how to motivate students? Thank you. Maybe we can start with Jasmine. Okay, so what motivates me is that um, I think in Nairo itself, all of us know that uh, we have came up with our Tower Revolutions. We also have our Slim Series nowadays. So we can see that our customers coming in to ask us, their, their preference today are slightly different from previous. So that motivates us that we know that our series that we are going to launch, it has to go that way uh, to, together with them. That's why we are flexible to adapt along with the, the trend. So that motivates us. So how to motivate the students? So... When you come um, in terms of selecting the materials that you want to use in your proposals today, definitely you can look at materials that such as like more sustainability, our slim, 35% lesser, or either you can also use something which is called our sleep stop, where you can use one surface for diverse needs. 
can go to your living room, it can be at your balcony or even outdoor. So that's part of it that you could look at. Yeah. Uh, my first job was, was with Sir Norman Foster's um, and they were already doing green buildings. So I didn't want to come home and work with my boss. I preferred to work with Sir Norman Foster because um, it was cheap. It was uh, very, very hard. Um, I worked um, five months every weekend, um, but I learned a lot and it was like, you know, wow, this is a great place to work. So for me, it was, and they were doing green buildings already uh, there. And I, that's when I came back when we worked on the Telecom Malaysia building. Um, so um, I guess it was, you know, really interesting place um, and really good stuff happening and really relevant. So if that is not um, exciting enough for this generation, then I don't know what is because for me it was, you know, we were doing interesting glazing and um, exciting buildings. The forms were interesting, all this sort of thing. So I think um, appeal is one. Uh, I mean, uh, and now it's really ironic. I, I mean, I was doing more technology-based buildings. Um, I probably still like a lot of technology-based. Mine Ours is about transparency, light, uh, things like that. That's why Securities Commission. But um, the ecological thing, I mean, my mother was in WWF. I, you know, I knew she was doing trees, but um, it's only sunk into my head right now about um, the importance of trees. Or actually, I kind of knew, but um, um, probably as I'm getting a bit older, I'm deciding that uh, trees are more important than anything else. But um, so, yeah, I think it's the environment. Uh, so if, if you're lucky enough to go and work with somebody who's doing green, that seems exciting. Um, you know, people are going to gravi gravitate to that. that. That's for the young people. I, I wish I could tell you the story that is because of my future generations and all the rest of it. But I guess it just grew the passion for doing the right thing and seeing that something good can happen um, came out of it. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, well, I work with uh, Dr. King Yang, not Norman Foster. This is my first job during, during my intern and my part one. Uh, because Dr. King Yang is the most famous green architect in Malaysia and also the world. So I want to learn what is a green building about. So during my time like you as a student, I still don't know the, how important is it. I just thought this is just one of the design style. Yeah. Um, then I learned from him and then I went to Edinburgh and then I work in London. And then I see something, I smell something. Uh, the whole world talk about sustainable design. But our, we do not have a proper education on sustainable. No one tells us what is a sustainable systematically, structurally. We learn from uh, this architect, we learn from that guys, we learn from the book. So I decided to further my study in NUS Singapore. Uh, they have a sustainable master degree. So I further the master and then we have a lot of research uh, program. And, and since then, I see all the figures, all the truth, all the data. I know that this is something that is not optional to our generations. It's not optional because it's really, it's a problem to all of us. I want to do it, I keep doing it, it's because uh, I want a good life. I think every one of us want a good life. Do, do we want to, to live in the polluted Kuala Lumpur? Do we want to live in the high carbon P, uh, P, PMI 25, you know, 400 P, uh, PMI? Uh, environment or we want to live in some way is green, some way is natural, some way is healthy. That is what I fight for. And I keep teaching it because I know with my own self, I can't change the world. But with young people, <laughs> I teach nine years, I do the calculations, I, I share this idea for almost a few thousand students. A few thousand of you can make change. Therefore, we keep doing the education, 
we keep doing research on that. How to motivate the young students is simple. 20 years later, it's not our time. It's your time. You are the one who live with 80 billion people in this planet. You are the one who are facing your lifestyle. We already enjoy our lifestyle. We have our big house. But your time, you don't have a big house. You have a big swamp area. But you, it's pigeon, pigeon house. You is the one who, who fight for your future, not us. We are here to, to tell you the truth, to share what we know, and it's real things. We are fight for surviving. Uh, therefore, we, uh, this is the motivation. Every time we think about surviving, we think about my kids. What's the future like? Then I have to wake up on Saturday morning for this talk. <laughs> So from my point of view, I think we design the buildings for people. Okay. So um, with sustainability, it helps. It helps the people to have a comfort life, right? It brings benefits to the community as well in the long term. So there's something that um, motivate me to further and um, doing in sustainable buildings. So for the students, I think something that motivates you, it probably is your future generations, right? Think about your kids, right? There are someone who are going to benefit from so what you are going to propose to them. Okay, thank you very much all. So now, ladies and gentlemen, that will be all for our Q&A sections, right? Thank you all for the informative and interactive sections. It was indeed fun to address all the interesting queries from our participants.